Hey guys, Antoinette Russell here, here to um, discuss all the wonderful things of chapter six with uh, sensation, perception, and motor. Uh, so let's get started. Um, I think it is a very large chapter that covers a lot of information. Um, so I'm going to touch on some highlighted points that I think are important as long as I will share some personal stories with you guys as well. So I think it's interesting how it talked about the um, visual perspective, you know, with children and their vision developing and how, you know, obviously when children are first born, their eyes are not developed at all. And then as they age a little bit and get a little bit older um, into the one, two, three months, their eyes develop more and they can see more clearly. Um, it's interesting how children are drawn to faces, real live faces, um, as opposed to like two dimensional images, uh, which I think is really important as you know, it's hard now thinking about it when people are wearing a mask. And so this is what a child would see, right? Like you see half of a person's face. Um, luckily here at the CDL, we have really nice clear masks that we wear. So there's a cutout so the child can see, you know, our facial expressions when we're talking, all that type of stuff. Uh, when we're singing songs, you know, and they say it's really important also uh, if you want a child to repeat a word after you uh, once they get a little older that you point to your chin and bring attention right here to your mouth so that they can really kind of zoom in on what you're talking about. Uh, so I think that's really important. Um, I think it's also important though for children to be read to at an early age. Um, after we brought Rochelle home from the hospital, she was literally like two weeks old. And I'm like, okay, Josh, here you go. It's time to read her a book. And every night, you know, she would sit with him and I mean, he would hold her and he would read a book, you know? And he's like, is this really doing anything? I'm like, yes, you are bonding with your daughter. This is what we're doing, you know? Um, it took a little bit of convincing and everything. Cause he's like, I just feel like I'm wasting my time. I'm like, no, she is in taking all this information, you know? Um, and to this day, she loves books. She's not the avid reader that I hope she would be. Um, she enjoys you reading to her, but when it comes to her actually reading, she still um, does a little bit of struggling with, you know, some sight words and she'll mix up V and A, which I think is interesting. Um, but, you know, we're still working at it. Every night we do our sight words and that type of thing. Uh, and she's seven years old, so that's what we've got. Uh, I also think, it's interesting to talk about the children uh, who need corrective uh, glasses and or contacts uh, to help them see. So many years ago, I had a child in my class um, and her parents did not want her to wear glasses and she wore contacts. And every morning they would lay her down. I mean, this is a child who's not even two yet. They would lay her down and it would take uh, both mom and dad a good 30 to 45 minutes to put her contacts in her eyes every morning so that she could come to school. And then once she came to school, she was not allowed to play in the sandbox. Um, luckily at that point, our sandbox was really small. And so she still had a large area of playground that she could explore. Um, but yeah, she, they did not want her wearing glasses. They were like, we don't want her to have that stigma of wearing glasses, which I think that's very surprising. Um, I've seen a lot of other children young toddlers, older toddlers, preschool age children um, who wear glasses and they do it really well for the most part. Uh, usually they have a strap that goes from the glasses around their head uh, to keep the glasses on during the day. Um, and once they get you know, used to, it usually takes about one to two weeks for them to get used to wearing the glasses and they'll do great. So a couple years ago we had a little girl um, in my class and she came back after the winter break and we were like, hey, her eye is doing something really strange. Um, she would look at you with one eye, but then the other eye would kind of go off to the side. And I was like, hmm, it, she was not doing that when she left us before the winter break in December. Uh, so I called her mom and I talked to her and I was like, hey, have you noticed this thing that she does with her eye? And she was like, yes, isn't it a cool new trick? And I'm like, hmm, I don't really think it's a trick. Rick. And so we talked about it a little bit more and I was like, I really recommend that you, you know, talk to your pediatrician, see what they have to say. 
maybe get an appointment with an eye doctor, see what's going on with that. Um, and she did, she went to her pediatrician, pediatrician referred her to a, a pediatric eye doctor locally in town, went and got her checked and they're like, oh yeah, she can't see, like she needs glasses now. Um, and then within about two weeks, she, they had her fitted for glasses and she wears glasses and now the little girl can see and it's amazing. Um, same situation with a child last year, uh, we had a little girl and she was very cautious with walking around and the way that she would look at her food in front of her she would kind of like bring her head in to like look at her plate of food which was not a very normal reaction like usually children would just bring their head down but not down and in like that um and so we recommended to her mom you know hey have you thought about getting her eyes checked you know what do you think and they're like oh no she's okay she's okay they were very adamant that she was okay and nothing was wrong with her vision um and then as you know the pandemic happened everything shut down we didn't see this family for a good three months um and i actually got in touch with them again you know i'd been in touch with them the entire process but not actually seen the child um, and I saw her in real life and she had the cutest little pair of pink glasses. And I was like, oh, she's got glasses. That's amazing. And mom goes, yeah, we took her to the eye doctor and our poor little girl was blind as a bat. We had no idea. And I'm like, well, that's good. I'm glad, you know, I didn't want to bring up the fact, well, remember we mentioned this back, you know, in November and everything, but they got her glasses and that's what mattered. That was the important thing. Um, so just, I think, Remembering when you're working with children and families, you know, sometimes parents are not the most willing to admit that their child might need something corrective, whether it's glasses, whether it's AFOs, um, any type of thing. So just kind of, you know, helping that family understand, hey, I think she needs to get her eyes checked or he really would benefit if he was seen by this specialist and that type of thing. Uh, and really just advocating for the child because as the professional, you know what is best uh, for the children. Um, so yeah, that's talking about that. Um, and then to talk about with the whole music sensation, I know there's a lot of pregnant moms who will listen to classical music uh, while their child is in utero. And then, you know, they'll play classical music for their child to go to sleep at night. And that really helps them um, and it just makes them, you know, it's calming, it's soothing. Children know what to expect. I know here uh, in the Young Color classroom, we have the same nap time music that we use every day, all year long, you know. And the children know, hey, when they hear this music, it's time to calm down, it's time to go lay on our cot, this is what we're gonna do. It's nap time, right? It's not time to jump up and run around and have a party. You sometimes they think it is, but that's not what we're doing, right? Um, so just really, you know, using music to benefit uh, when it comes to uh, scheduling activities, that type of thing. Um, so children know what to expect. Um, I also thought it was interesting how they talked about the sense of taste and, you know, children that are, you know, infants that have something traumatic happen, whether it's a shot or any type of pain, if they're given you know, the sweet sucrose right afterwards, they're, you know, they don't cry as often or as much from that pain. Um, and same with Rochelle and Jacob, whenever they would go to the pediatrician and get a shot before the age of one, I would immediately, after that shot, I would nurse them for five minutes, you know? And I'm like, hey, for one, they're not screaming at the top of their lungs because they're nursing. And for two, I think it's gonna help make them feel a little bit better, you know? Um, and it did, you know, and that way I'm not carrying this screaming child out of the pediatrician's office where other children are looking at him like, oh no, what happened to that child, you know? Um, and then we'd go get in the car and go to school and everything would be a lot better. So just kind of keep that in the back of your mind as well. Um, if and when you do become a parent and you're having to deal with the monthly shots that children get and they get shots all the time. It's insane, but it's for a good cause. So yeah, just keep that in mind. Um, and I think it's also interesting how it talked about fine motor. Um, Rochelle, as a child, had very excellent fine motor uh, during Christmas time. So she was nine months old. She would crawl around on the floor and she'd pick up the teeniest, tiny little pine needle that came off our Christmas tree and she would just pick it up 
and she would look at it and examine it and then she'd put it back down. Um, she never put things in her mouth like that, which I think was really interesting and also exciting. Uh, she did not get sick as often, I think, because of that. And then um, the same with Jacob. He also had the best fine motor abilities. Uh, I think they get that both from their father because he's a very tactile, work with his hands type of person. Um, even, I, like I said, I've known him for a long time. When we were 14 and 15 and dating, we'd be talking on the phone, you know, and I'm like, what are you doing? He's like, mm, I'm taking apart my alarm clock. And I'm like, you're doing what? And he's like, yeah, I'm taking apart my alarm clock. I'm like, why? Is it broken? He's like, no, just to see how it works and see what's going on in there. And then I'm gonna put it back together. I'm like, okay, sounds good. Sure, yeah, do whatever you wanna do. Um, but yes, both of our children inherited that liking to touch things, play with things, that type of thing. Um, but when it comes to gross motor, they were both extremely on the far end of being delayed when it comes to walking. Um, Rochelle's born in March, so there were children in her class that were born in the previous September, and then some children were born as late as June and July. Uh, she was the very last person to walk in her classroom. I was like, oh, she's never gonna get there, right? She eventually did, but everyone else beat her to it by a lot. Um, and so then when we had Jacob, I'm like, oh man, he's gonna really wanna walk and he's gonna be all about walking because he's gonna wanna keep up with his older sister and like that's what second children do. Yeah, we were way wrong, so wrong. Like we could not have been more wrong. We would stand him up, he'd wanna sit back down. He was super quick with crawling. It was amazing. He would crawl, he would move. He didn't wanna walk. Finally, he was 17 months old when he finally figured out how to walk. And he was like, hey, I got this. I'm doing great. Um, both my children, once they started walking, they hardly ever fell down. I think they just wanted to make sure they could do it and do a good job and be amazing. I love you. Um, that's another CDL teacher. She came to the gate and I got to see her and she's very amazing and excited. Um, she was Jacob's teacher last year and she's phenomenal. Her name is Miss Trisha. Yay. Um, but yeah, so like I said, just because one child is delayed doesn't mean the other child will be delayed. And just because one child is advanced doesn't mean the other child will be advanced. Um, sometimes both children are delayed and that was definitely our case when it came to the walking um, back to the fine motor thing sorry I'm kind of jumping around a little bit um, so Rochelle as a infant she refused to eat food with her fingers most children you know you put a plate of food in front of them and they're gonna pick up the food with their fingers and put it in their mouth she would not do that um, you could hand her a fork and you could stab the food with the fork and then she would pick up the fork and then put the food in her mouth and then put the fork back down and then you pick up the fork, stab some more food and put the food in her mouth. Uh, she did not want to touch anything with her hands. Um, and I always joke because the whole time she was in utero, she heard me yelling at all the young toddlers, use your spoon, use your fork, what are you doing? That's what we're doing, we're using our spoon, we have utensils, use them, use them, use them. Um, so yeah. We had to kind of get her to the process where, hey, it's okay to touch food with our hands. It's okay to explore and get our hands messy. Um, she didn't like that. She didn't like her hands being dirty or messy. Uh, still to this day, she doesn't like to get, she'll play outside, but she doesn't want her hands to get dirty. So she's got a little sensitivity to that. Um, Jacob, he would eat anything and everything with his hands. He was not scared to get messy. Um, when Rochelle was an infant, she would eat spaghetti. She'd just have a little bit like right around her mouth. Jacob, when he was an infant, he would eat spaghetti. It would be everywhere. It'd be in his hair. He'd have it in his ear, behind his ear, down his neck, everywhere, right? Um, and also another difference. So Rochelle was a big time thumb sucker when it came to, you know, soothing herself, going to sleep at night, in the car, she would suck her thumb. She wouldn't do it if we were just like playing around or anything, 
but she definitely was into sucking her thumb and that's one of the ways that she would self-soothe. Now as a seven-year-old, when you schedule that virtual appointment with an orthodontist, the orthodontist says, mm, yeah, which of her fingers does she suck or does she suck her thumb? I'm like, oh, she sucked her thumb, you know? Um, so we got this nice little clear nail polish to put on each of her fingernails before going to bed at night so she doesn't suck her thumb, right? After the first night, she woke up and she was crying. She was like, I didn't even suck my thumb. I just, I, I dreamed about it and then this bad taste was in my mouth. And she went to the bathroom and she was drinking water and spitting it out in the sink. She was so upset, right? Because she was asleep and subconsciously she put her thumb in her mouth and she's like, oh, it tastes terrible, you know? So then we've gotten onto the, hey, don't put your thumb in your mouth and you won't have this bad taste in your mouth, right? And then she's like, but I don't, I don't know that I'm doing it. I'm like, right, that's why we have this on your fingernail. So when you do put your thumb in your mouth, you have the bad taste and you take your thumb out, right? And that's gonna help your teeth and your mouth form properly, right? It's very hard to convince a seven-year-old of this. So last night we're at home putting on the nail polish and she's like, oh, it tastes terrible. And what does Jacob do? He's four. Oh, really? It tastes bad? And Rochelle's like, oh, it's awful. And he goes, well, let me try. So he licks one of her fingernails and he's like, oh, it's so bad. Oh, it's gross. Yuck, yuck, yuck. And we're like, we told you it tasted bad. What were you thinking, you know? And then he went and got water. The water didn't help. He got some milk. The milk didn't help. And he was like, I think I just need to brush my teeth again. He brushed his teeth again. He could still taste it in his mouth, right? And I joked with Rochelle, I'm like, would you try something that someone told you tasted bad? And she was like, no, why would anyone do that? You know, and it's, he's different. That's who he is, right? He's curious. He wants to know what's going on. Hey, you said it's gross. Let me try and I'll tell you. Um, and that also shows in their taste buds with food, right? He's way more adventurous in trying different sauces, different spices, all that stuff. If Rochelle sees one little black fleck of flake of black pepper on her green bean. She's like, what is that? And I'm like, it's pepper. I don't like pepper. Pepper is gross. I'm like, just try it. It tastes good. People naturally salt and pepper vegetables and they're delicious. Um, so yeah, just exposing children to different foods, different tastes, different textures. Um, it's really important when a child is around that eight to nine month area of age exposing them to more table foods 10 to 12 months exposing them to more table foods right don't only feed your child the cute little pouches that you can get at the grocery store until they're a year and a half because then when that time comes they're only going to want pouches right they have never had that different textures in their mouth and they're not going to know what to do with it right um, right now, there's a little boy in our young toddler class currently who, you know, during this pandemic of being at home, his parents continually, oh, just give him a pouch, give him a pouch. It's easy. We're stressed out. That's the best thing for our family right now. You know, now that he's back at school and we're exposing him to rice and beans, mac and cheese, pizza, he is having a really hard time. He'll put it in his mouth and he'll spit it out because he's not used to that texture, right? 10 months old, texture, texture, texture. Expose them to texture so that they can experience what it tastes like in their mouth and feel like in the process of, this is what it's like to chew this is how I have to move my jaw to chew my food and then swallow, right? Whereas a pouch, you put it in your mouth and you can, you can suck it, right? Just like sucking out of a bottle, it's the same thing. You've got to use a whole different set of muscles when you're chewing your food, right? So that's what I have to say about gross motor, fine motor, perception sensation, all those wonderful things. Um, we are having our 
live Zoom on Thursday at 11.10 um, to 12.25, I think it is. Um, so we will talk about any questions you may have, the format of the midterm. Um, it's gonna be 75 questions. There's gonna be true, false, multiple choice, matching. Um, you will have um, October 13th, the Tuesday that our midterm is scheduled. You will have that time to complete the midterm, right? But once you start, you're only gonna have a certain amount of time to do it, which is what our class time is, right? But you can start it at 10 o'clock in the morning or you can start it at 10 o'clock at night. But you're gonna have to complete it sometime on Tuesday and your grade will be graded immediately. So you'll know that immediately. Um, position paper grades will be posted hopefully by uh, no later than this weekend. You guys have done really well on them. I'm very pleased with that. Um, if you have any other questions, please email me. Thank you again for everything and allowing me to be your teacher. And I will see you guys on Thursday at our live Zoom. Okay, thanks so much. Bye.